Welcome to the MSU Deer Labs online seminar series, brought to you by Mississippi State University Extension Service and the Forest and Wildlife Research Center. My name is Steve Damaris, and I'm the Taylor Chair in Applied Big Game Research and Instruction at Mississippi State University. Thanks for joining me. If you've listened to our seminar on nutritional ecology of white-tailed deer, you understand already that the life stages that deer go through throughout the year determine their nutritional needs. For example, an adult female, her life stage needs are greatest during that late gestation and lactation, much greater than they are during the winter when it might be colder, but she's not having to grow babies and feed those babies. And the same with those fawns, their first full year of life, they have important growth requirements. And if they don't have adequate nutrition during those growth spurts, then they're not going to be able to grow as effectively. So these life stages that deer go through throughout the year determine what type and how much nutrition they need. And habitat must be evaluated relative to those deer requirements. Because if you don't have habitat that's fulfilling those needs, then there will be a potential nutritional bottleneck. That habitat is not able for, to fulfill the nutritional requirements and it limits the development of your deer population. Land use decisions are often made based on the quality of the soil and what the soil is best suited to produce. Within the lower coastal plain, the southern region of the state of Mississippi, and it crosses across the southern portions of Alabama and into Florida and southern Georgia. This lower coastal plain is oftentimes best suited to producing pines. And so pines, when they're managed for pine production or timber production as a primary objective, their land management decisions are not always in the best interest of white-tailed deer. And this earlier research by Strickland and Damaris showed that within the lower coastal plain, there was a, a significant negative relationship between antler size of two and a half year old bucks and the percentage of the land or the property that was made up of intensively managed pine plantations. More pine plantations, smaller antlers. Fewer pine plantations, larger antlers. Now this is not to vilify pine plantation management. It's just a, an optimum product for the soil characteristics within the lower coastal plain. But we have to identify and understand that a lot of intensively managed pine plantations are not necessarily going to be great deer habitat. And that's a basis for a lot of our research, trying to understand how forest land management decisions impact habitat quality for deer. Forest land management is not always conducive to white-tailed deer, particularly pine plantations. However, most landowners do allow or promote a habitat problem mitigation approach, and that's food plots. Southern hunters in particular like to put in food plots to supplement the food supply of their deer population and also as a hunting aid during the, the fall hunting season. If they can attract the deer out into the food plots, then they can more readily harvest them. There's a problem with this traditional habitat mitigation approach, however. This problem centers on a couple of basic facts related to food plots that limit their success mitigating the lack of food one of them is available acreage. If you are a private industrial landowner, you are trying to produce as much of the economic product on your land base as possible. That primary economic product is timber. And so you're not going to allow much area or much acreage to be planted as food plots. Most industrial timber lands in the South that allow food plots allow them on what are referred to as loading decks, areas where they come in and they harvest timber from an area and they, they have a, a small area that they work out of. Once they complete the harvest process in that area, that loading deck is left and so they allow hunters that are leasing the property to plant food plots in them. 
So there's a limited acreage available on most forested lands for food plots if you are trying to get as much timber production as possible. Another problem with food plots is the year or the season in which you most need them to supplement the nutritional intake of your deer population. Those are the times when the food plots are least able to produce that supplemental forage. If there's a dry summer and you want to plant a summer food plot to help that nutritional stress period, well, you may not even be able to grow a crop. And they're also fairly expensive, and I'll talk a little bit more about comparative expenses of food plots later in this presentation. Timber production is critically important to the Southeast. It is a multi, multi-billion dollar industry. It's critically important to the economic health of the Southeast. We are the, the wood basket of the United States and potentially of the world, and so it's a really big deal. And because of that, there is a lot of acreage in pine plantations, intensively managed properties with the goal of producing timber. Nothing wrong with that. It's a, it's a great use of the land. So deer biologists are oftentimes managing deer habitat within timber management regimes. The primary decisions are made to benefit timber, while important secondary decisions can be made to benefit the deer within those timbered lands. Forested lands are managed in units of habitat, some anywhere in the southeast from 30 acres to 100 or 120 acre blocks of a what is called a stand. Okay, and with this unit, this stand typically is harvested as a unit, it's replanted as a unit, and it is managed as a unit through what's referred to as the rotation. The rotation is the length of production from harvest until the next harvest. And wildlife habitat quality varies dramatically based on which stage in the rotation you're looking at. These two photos pretty dramatically show differences in the vegetative characteristics of deer habitat based on the stage of the rotation. The photo on the left is titled Regeneration, and this is actually a three-year-old stand that has had pines planted three years previously, and you can see those pines poking out from the, the lower vegetation. The photo on the right is a timber stand with a SMZ, or streamside management zone, running down through the middle of it, but on either side you can see rows of trees, and these are pine trees that have been, looks like they've, uh, later in the rotation, they've been thinned, possibly on a third row basis, and these thinned pines are dramatically different habitat than the habitat during the regeneration stage. So three-year-old pines, probably 18 or 19-year-old pines in the right-hand side. It's kind of difficult to say what a typical rotation is like because it's very much based on the soil quality. Better quality soils can produce faster growth and so a better quality soil will have a shorter rotation than a lower quality soil type. But there's just some uh, examples of typical loblolly pine plantation rotation lengths and the different stages within the southeastern United States. You harvest the, the stand, and then there's some post-harvest site preparation. And that takes place, say, during year zero. The stand has been harvested, the timber has been taken away, and now let's prepare it for the next planting. So that site preparation typically in, involves some type of control of future competition, as well as preparation of the soil for planting. But again, those, those two things are dependent upon the actual site characteristics. There's no one way that it's always done. Planting takes place in, say, year one, and those trees are gonna grow as rapidly as they can until they experience what's called canopy closure. And the canopy closure is when the, the edges of rows of pine trees 
come together and close out the canopy so that if you look at it from above, all you see is the tops of pine trees. Once canopy closure takes place, there will typically be another five to 10 years of growth allowed on that timber stand so that the pine trees can undergo self pruning. And that's important to remove the excess branches to produce a timber product that has fewer knots in it. And about 12 to 15 years after planting, a stand, a Loblolly pine stand, typically will be ready for thinning. And this is the case where the, this complete canopy closure has been a lot of growth of the pine trees up and wood added to the, the, the trunk of the tree. And in the process, a lot of timber has been produced. And at some stage, pine trees start limiting their own growth. And that's when it's best to come in and thin now, I mentioned earlier a third row thinning approach. That's fairly common in the southeast where a harvesting crew will come in and every third row they will harvest every tree within that, that row. And then they'll use harvester select on either side of that, that harvested row and they'll reach in and harvest lower quality trees from the remaining two rows. And that way they are removing the lower quality younger trees during this thinning period and leave the better quality trees which can grow then un, unlimited by their surrounding trees for a while and produce better quality timber for the final harvest. The final harvest on industrial forest lands typically takes place somewhere around year 22 to 23. So the, the total rotation for a typical Loblolly pine plantation is around 22 to 23 or 24 years. And at that point, there's a final harvest and you start back with that post-harvest site preparation. Alternatively, you could let the trees grow again after thinning and get to a closed canopy condition again and they start limiting themselves and you could come in for a second thinning. Say, well, the year that it would normally be ready for final harvest, you could come in and take another crop, another removal of timber from that stand. And this is gonna be more uh, financially valuable timber compared to that first thin, which is often referred to as pulp wood. It's the type of tree that is taken to produce paper and cardboard. They're not usually used to produce lumber. But the final harvest primarily is used for lumber production. The second thinning could also produce trees of greater value for lumber production. And again, the second thinning would open the canopy again, remove that limitation, and allow the trees to grow taller still and produce more wood product on the stems. And during the second thinning and time towards final harvest, there are continued benefits from the wildlife recreation that is occurring underneath these trees. And so it's fair to say most of the time when there's a second thinning and an extension of the rotation, that's happening on private non-industrial lands where the landowner isn't mostly concerned with the economic return they want to recreate and particularly manage for oftentimes game species or perhaps even non-game species underneath these crop trees. And then there might be a final harvest around years 30 or 32. And you could even, if you wanted to, you could even have a third thinning to extend it even longer. The longer the rotation, the bigger the trees get. And you might reach a point where the trees are so big that they cannot be commercially processed into timber because most timber processing facilities are geared towards trees of a certain diameter. If you let your trees get greater than that diameter that can be handled by the sawmills, they 
can't take those products and so you won't be able to sell them. Working with a registered forester in your area so that they can understand your landowner objectives can help make those decisions about whether or not you have a second or maybe a third thinning within your pine plantation.